Harry Merola uh, from sociology. His uh, talk today is uh, racial differences in social mobility across three generations. designed it for uh, the humanities audience, just a few numbers, and, uh, you know, some creative imagery, at least to me, um, so you see, and probably shorter because we just don't write as well. Um, <laughs> just put it out there, you know. <laughs> so, <clears throat> upward social mobility, or right, the attainment of a higher social status than your family of origin is really the quintessence of the American achievement ideology. And uh, due to the importance of this ideology to, to the American, Americans' ideas of what our country means, right, the land of opportunity, many Americans, if not most Americans, mistakenly believe that there are more opportunities for social mobility in the United States than there are in other countries. In addition, most Americans believe that the key engine of social mobility, particularly for traditionally disadvantaged groups, is the educational system, right? And so the typical story goes that you work hard, you get a good education, and you can achieve uh, a higher status than you came from. However, for black and Hispanic Americans, um, the recipe for upward social mobility may not be so straightforward. So despite a substantial increase in educational attainment, or years of education attained, um, in the decades since the Civil Rights Movement, economic mobility for black and Hispanic Americans has remained elusive. So for instance, you can see here, in 1967, black earned families earned 56 cents for each dollar earned by white families. Um, fast forward to 2014, um, about 70 years after the Civil Rights Act gave uh, putative equality to all Americans, and we see black families earning just 62 cents for each dollar earned by white families. And so sort of the research question that was guiding this project is why has the social mobility for black and Hispanic Americans stagnated over the last several decades despite um, increasing educational attainment? So as sort of the theoretical framework, I use what we call in sociology a social reproduction model. And so a social reproduction model is in stark contrast to sort of that achievement ideology that I outlined earlier. Um, instead, a social reproduction model suggests that education systems generally will serve a conservative role in society and will tend to reproduce existing social hierarchies. So these models really do point out is that the education system is endogenous to the society that it's somehow supposed to change. And so when you sort of look through history, what you see is that there's really not that much evidence of educational systems providing this sort of revolutionary transformative role. Instead, they just generally tend to look like the same society that they're a part of. Um, and so this model basically rejects the idea that, that social hierarchies seen in other facets of society won't also be seen within the educational system. And um, importantly, Another function served by the education system in these, from this model is this legitimation function. So the model also argues that the education system serves to legitimate social inequality by again providing this idea that there are these ladders of social mobility available that um, minority groups are simply not taking advantage of. Um, so for instance, right, despite years of empirical evidence indicating that um, black and Hispanic Americans are family focused, they value education, they're industrious, they're hardworking. Um, we still see many Americans um, labeling and stereotyping these groups as somehow lazy, criminal, undesirable neighbors, and um, poor employees. 
So our basic social reproduction model really is sort of generated in um, Europe um, in the 70s and 80s. So when we kind of apply this to the racial dynamics in the United States, we sort of want to bring in um, another perspective. And so I draw here on the work of Melvin Oliver and Thomas Shapiro, who have you know had this great book years ago about that really outline the historical processes that lead to differences in uh, wealth holdings between black and white families, mainly. And so two concepts that I was sort of drawn on here, the first one is this economic detour. And so Oliver and Shapiro describe how even when uh, minorities were able to successfully start businesses or gain some inroads, right, they essentially took this economic detour, meaning they were not able to participate in the mainstream American economy, and instead generally were serving um, niche markets and markets that frankly had limited buying power, right? And so if we think back even to say the boom years post-World War II, right? Lots of people starting businesses and those businesses were, if they were successful, they could pass that wealth on to the next generation. Um, and some groups just didn't have access to these types of, the ability to sort of participate in the mainstream. Right, so we can think of this if we're thinking of the theme, right? One group of people sort of on this economic highway, and the other groups of people sort of relegated to a detour on a side road, not moving nearly as quickly. That was my creative imagery yeah. part of it. <laughs> and so again, the point, the key point is just sort of this lack of um, the ability to participate fully. And moreover, they describe how these patterns of inequality really become built into the social structure with, through a process that they describe as the sedimentation of racial inequality. And the sedimentation of racial inequality describes how racial differences, which namely right, white supremacy, um, becomes a routinized, obdurate part of the social structure that's simply not seen as problematic and is accepted as normal by most people. And so the problem, again, is not just that past exclusion led to certain groups starting with less, but again, they're sort of playing on a fundamentally unfair field where they're not able to translate um, the resources they do have into resources in future generations. And again, because uh, we don't see <coughs> the sort of roots of this type of inequality in these historical processes, it's not widely recognized and the, um, the low standing of minority groups is taken as itself evidence for their lack of effort or their lack of um, ability to sort of achieve economically. So to summarize here, um, I'm basically arguing that the sedimentation of racial, through the sedimentation of racial inequality, black and Hispanic Americans not only started with fewer resources in past generations, but they also benefited less from those resources over time. Um, the lack of payoff for educational attainment has led to fundamentally different mobility processes for uh, white Americans compared to Americans of color. So the data that I use for this project come from a large government sponsored survey called the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth. And the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth, those of us in the um, quantitative world just call it the NLSY, this was a national probability sample that took place of Americans age 14 to 21, 1978. So in 1978, they took this massive probability sample, I think it was somewhere around 11,000 um, young adults. They interviewed them every year between 1979 and 1994, and then finally after that through today. I mean, maybe not today, through last year. And then you can also combine this main NLSY sample with what's called the NLSY child and young adult sample. So then in 1986, in 1986, they started surveying all the children that were born to any woman who was in the original sample. Right, so we had sort of the main sample in 1979, and then they started interviewing those children. And it, those children were of a variety of ages when they started, and then any child who was born since then. So that's, it's not actually 956 for black and white, but it's close to that. But there's over 900 black, about 471 Hispanic, and 956 white families 
then that becomes sort of the cases for the data. And we can sort of think about through, you know, we have sort of information then from three generations within these families. So if we think about generation one, and these are going to be the maternal grandparents because of the way the data were structured, right? They interviewed people born to the mother, right? So we have inner data on the maternal grandparents. This was collected in 1979 by asking questions to the main respondent that year. And they were born between 1900 and 1955. Sort of, we'll call them generation one. Generation two, we're calling the parents. They had to live in the parental home in 1979, so they weren't already adults at that time. Um, and they were born between 1957 and 1965. Generation three, we'll call the focal person. They had to be at least 30 years old in 2012. And so they were born between 1971 and 1982. And so those are the three generations of, within the same family that, that we're going to look at. So for the variables here, it's not as many as we would like to have, but try to keep measures that we could have that were analogous or comparable across the different years. So we have, for generation one, there's just two, grandparents educational attainment, that's in years zero to 20. And then a natural log of their family income in 2012 dollars in 1970. So for generation two, the parents, we have a couple more variables. So we have this AFQT test, the Armed Forces Qualification Test, that was taken in 1981, kind of a general um, academic achievement score that you get from that. We have educational attainment at age 30, again, um, 0 to 20, I think. Um, natural log of family income. And then for generation two, we have marital status. And finally, for generation three, we have a similar but a different achievement test. This is called the PIAC math score, um, which was an average of, they took it up to six times. Again, educational attainment, natural log of family income, marital status. And then for the last generation here, the uh, focal person, we have their gender, because it's not sort of family measures. To do the analysis, we use a multi-group structural equation model, really asking, again, do these parameters of social mobility vary by race, right? Are there different relationships across the generations that link these different factors um, between families of different uh, racial backgrounds? And then for this presentation, I'll mainly just present some counterfactual results if we sort of make different assumptions in this model. So, sort of the general version here of the model. So we can see each time we have education, sort of generation one, is always affecting income, and that's the same here across. And then we're also looking at how education in one generation sort of has effects in the next generation. And then at two and three, we have these, I guess I can't really see it on white, the two sort of achievement scores. So to start the analysis, we can just look at some. These are just the, the observed descriptive statistics. And here's education by race across the three generations. And this was sort of that pattern I alluded to earlier, where we see the disparities in educational attainment um, getting somewhat more muted as we move through, right? So can you see that? Generation one, you have more of a gap here between the white is uh, the red one, uh, black is the orange, and Hispanic is yellow. But then when we move to generation two, right, so these were like people born between the 50s. Much less of a difference there in educational attainment. And then generation three, again, a slight difference, but not nearly what we saw for generation one, right? People born between 1900 and 1955. So then when we look to income, we see the differences remain more stable, right? And so again, this kind of the, the basic premise here is how do we have this declining inequality in educational attainment, but we're not seeing a commensurate decline in inequality of income. And you also have like, you know, the people in generation one, they it looks like they earned more, but it was mostly because they were older. So two and three they were only 30. So as I said, I'm going to uh, 
present some results from counterfactual models, really based on two scenarios. So the first scenario is sort of, we can call it an equal start scenario. So here, we're basically predicting um, income and education at times two and three, generation two and three, if we say, okay, well, what if all the groups started with the same amount of income and the same amount of education? So what we see with those models is that the model predicts um, white Americans to continue to outpace, right? The difference in education are actually predict larger um, predicted than we actually observe. And then for income, it's similar. Um, so when we just sort of say, well, what if we had an equal start with the same process across all the groups? How much of this inequality do we explain? And the answer here is really not that much, right? So just that unequal start um, doesn't explain why we have seen this stagnation. So next, two sets of models are models where we take, so if we have this process again, right, we allow sort of those paths to vary by race. And so what if we take the paths for white adults and apply those to all the up to black and Hispanic? So what we see here is when we look at the model this way, we see far less predicted differences in generations two and three, right? So in both for education here and also for income, right? So if we take the same sort of mobility parameters that we see for white Americans and we apply those to black and Hispanic Americans, we see that they're predicted to see far fewer disparities in income in particular in generations two and three than what we actually observe than what we would actually observe. So what does this all mean? Well, I think the first sort of take home point is that black and Hispanic Americans are really disadvantaged, not just by um, unequal starts to this process, right? It wasn't just that they, as I mentioned before, started the race behind, but they were sort of running uphill, right? So across generations, from generation one to two, and from two to three, white Americans benefited far more from the educational attainment and income of their families compared to black and, their black and Hispanic counterparts. What we particularly see is that the relationship between education and income in generation one and those two achievement tests that I mentioned are drastically different um, for whites compared to blacks and Hispanics. So we can see for generation one education on that AFQT test, right, which again, this is general sort of achievement test. We can see the effect, so for each additional year of parents' education, right, um, whites in the next generation were gaining twice as much in terms of this achievement score than their black and Hispanic counterparts. And similar for income, right, it's not really a dollar of income, but you can see, again, the effect of income on that achievement test in the second generation was, almost, was more than double um, for white Americans compared to black and Hispanic. And similarly, we see the same pattern here with looking at, again, this is sort of the grandparents' income on the, I guess, the grandchild's um, math achievement. The education, the difference is a little, is not quite as dramatic, but look at this for income, right? So, you know, white Americans in this third generation who, right, I mean, would be someone like my age, I would fit in there, um, were gaining, right, over three times as much from the income of their grandparents um, in, in, on their score on this math test. And then the scores on these achievement tests, right, are then the key drivers of sort of income at, within those generations. That effect was pretty similar across the groups. So the key point here, again, is sort of if we think about this American uh, ideology of achievement, right? And I think for most Americans, the data would suggest that they believe that, well, you know, there was racism and discrimination in the past, and then we've stopped that, and most of the problems we have now are just 
because you know people started behind, but society is basically equal now. And what I would argue is that's a complete myth based on the data that we have, right? And again, if we think about sort of that sedimentation of racial inequality, that really describes how those past processes of exclusion didn't just lead to people starting with less, but led to a fundamentally different structure of social mobility um, for people of different racial backgrounds. And so these historical processes deprive black and Hispanic Americans of education and income, both to starting with less, but more importantly, really from gaining less resources, from gaining less from the resources their families did start with. And so I argue that similarly to that economic detour that I alluded to earlier that um, Oliver and Shapiro have described, we can also think of this as an educational detour. And so namely, although black and Hispanic Americans are gaining more years of education over these generations, it appears that they were not gaining education of the same quality and were not able to participate in the same education system as their white counterparts. And so this process over time of starting behind and also sort of moving uphill, right, we can think about, again, one group on a highway and another group in a detour on a side road, um, led over time to what has been described as an educational death. And so this was an influential paper in 2006 where um, Lansing Billing, who was president of the AERA, just was encouraging people to think about educational achievement differences as an educational debt rather than an, ed an achievement gap because it really sort of underscores something that accumulates over time, right? And if we think about it that way, sort of the approaches to redress this problem are gonna be much different. And so I would also argue that without a fundamental change in social organization and without a recognition um, and how routinized these types of differences are, right, we're likely to see these patterns continue into the next generation, right? That's what the social reproduction model would, would suggest. Thank you. David, I guess my, um, my quibble with statistics is that you Leave out some stuff. I think there needs to be, a, when you mentioned the economic detour, minorities excluded from participation in full economic boom after World War II, what should be in the footnote somewhere is that this money. Blacks, they could not get access to funding. Absolutely. It's part of the problem with Detroit now why black businesses, uh, folks don't invest, why Gilbert does everything. It's the money and, and racism expresses itself in supporting stuff financially, financial institutions. So that was the big problem. That's the structural problem of racism in America. And I mean, you all look at it, but I don't know the solution. I mean, it really is the body politic. It's in the fabric of American culture. It's the racism that's part and parcel of the whole American system of slavery. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, maybe I didn't express well, but that's exactly the idea, right? Is that they didn't have access to those same absolutely. markets. Not just customers, but credit. Absolutely. And there's another part of the racialization. And the housing thing here, all these housing exclusions in the Detroit area, I have friends who... Because there's actually... Housing in the area, it's in the, it's in the documents, don't sell to minorities and the black folks. Well, and you're exactly right, because there's a third component of that model, which is called the racialization of state policy, which speaks exactly to uh, that, particularly post-World War II housing, okay. and how right, sure. black Americans didn't have access, and this is where the white middle class built That's their true. wealth. Even when they had homes. money, yeah. you got the Austin Sweet case, where mm -hmm. you bought the house. And yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the market uh, justice. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, but this is the second talk within a, a week that have experienced uh, bright scholars like yourself describing the problem. And I'm wondering, <laughs> the next step would be to propose, and I don't know if that's a sociological uh, responsibility, an economic responsibility, but to, to present ideas that would solve the problem. I mean, we've had over the years, lots of people, very brave uh, scholars who are socially 
uh, motivated the kind of research that I find very enthralling, uh, describing these problems. And uh, the solutions uh, are what I am sort of looking for. So if you were to speculate, what would you propose? Well, I mean, obviously it's a difficult problem, but um, I think the first thing I would say is just sort of the mindset of thinking about it as a structural problem and not as an individual problem, right? So that would be sort of step one, would just be sort of changing the thinking. And then, I mean, in terms of what types of specific policies, there would be many, uh -huh. but I think you would really focus probably on um, school, and not just racial segregation, but economic segregation in schools, um, and then also thinking about, I don't know what you, early childhood, mm -hmm. right? I mean, in poor neighborhoods especially, school should start probably at like age three. It would make a wonderful working group if uh, sociologists and economists and other people can get together and propose a number of of solutions and take them to to Lansing, take them to Congress and say, look, this is the problem. We described it. Here are the solutions. Implement it and then share that information to to people who are activists and so that they can know that these ideas have been presented and hold people accountable to at least if not implementing them, uh, disputing them, or mm -hmm. talking about them, so that you have that kind of interaction. That would be, that would be great. Yeah. Um, so I had a question, forgive me if you explained it at the beginning of your talk, but I became increasingly interested in the, the word achievement as you were mm. describing it throughout, because then there are achievement tests, which I don't know the literature on them, but I know there is literature on how they're problematic and often sort of gender biased and socioeconomic, there's, there are all kinds of biases built into the achievement test. But when you talk about achievement society, are there other ways in which achievement is uh, articulated? Um, and obviously the income factor sort of adjusts a little bit. It shows the mapping of that achievement test onto other factors. But I'm just wondering how the actual structures of measurement are also problematic and maybe part of the, the problem in in the ultimate results, not sort of mapping out the way people want them to? No, that's a great question. So in educational research like this, we would differentiate educational attainment, years of education, degrees that you earned, versus achievement, which is test scores. And so I think a lot of the controversy surrounding those test scores is less about the tests themselves and more about how the differences on those test scores have been interpreted, right? And so if we see uh, a, a racial gap um, on this test score, what are we attributing that to? You know, so I think where we would say like, I don't know if I would use the word that it's sort of socioeconomically biased, but sort of understanding the reasons why people from different socioeconomic backgrounds generally do score differently on these exams. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I mean, if the controversy is more of an interpretation, then, I mean, the content, it's a, it's a test. But, you know, questions that have right or wrong answers. The, the math exam in particular is basically all numeric. Just a comment on that one. Um, with regard to something like the SAT or the ACT, we just had, uh, you know, university invitations go out in the mail. Um, there's a lot of money to be made as a private consultant to helping families of means to gain higher scores on those tests, which directly lead to admission to the most selective and prestigious universities. Uh, just an anecdote, not a piece of data, but I, I happen to know a guy uh, from grad school who um, has a big house in California, a Porsche, um, because he is the president of one of these academies in San Diego that charges thousands of dollars to prep families mm -hmm. uh, for these t uh, test scores. And I think uh, in several of the last years, Graduates from his academy have gotten into Stanford at a higher rate than any other such similar place in the United States. But it's literally 
tens of thousands of dollars that people will spend to raise their ACT from 30 to 36. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right. So I think it's that's not your data, but it's, it's somewhat the later idea. illustration mm -hmm. of the way in which the test. It's not exact. It's not the content of the test. It's the way in which the test can be like, gamed. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, so just in, in this type of research, people who took a different approach, and this is where I think it's problematic. They use that same test score and they call it ability. Yeah. Right, and so even yeah. if you just call it achievement, is kind of like showing what you think, right? Because I mean, as Robert alluded to, I mean, it's not you're not going to pay people a thousand dollars to get a higher score on this armed force qualification test on the survey, but they're doing that through private schools, through preschool, through right, right all these other yes. things that families of means can do that other families can't. Um, I'm connecting back to what Walter said. Um, so you said then the idea is to change the thinking to make people see it's structural. Um, but how do you do that? The U.S. is so built on that myth of individualism, exceptionalism. I try to uh, install critical thinking in my students. I'm, I'm from Germany. I'm trying to emphasize structural patterns. I find it very hard to get people to switch that thinking to recognize that because it's so ingrained in the American um, psyche. How do you do that? How do you change that thinking? Well, maybe we need to put on. Um Several sociology classes in the general education curriculum. <laughs> One idea. Um, but I, I'm really not sure. You know, and I mean, it's difficult. I think when Robert was speaking, I was going to also mention you know, when you think about sort of the changing of the thinking, right, in an issue like this, it's just seen as normal. Exactly. That yeah. they these swim differences in that water, exist, they right? The water that they swim in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And at any time, anything would be flipped, right? I mean, if you had, say, a university came out and said, well, we actually have our minority students are graduating at a higher rate than our white students. Well, that's when people would say, well, that sounds racist to me, right? But when it's the other way, it's just like, well, of course, right? These differences are just accepted as normal. I would just build on what Shana and Robert said. Uh, and you all have a responsibility to follow up down the road. Um, but the discussion of reparations, which is one way of, of talking about this issue, has tended to focus, even though it as a proposal remains a long shot in American society and politics, focuses on investing in African American education. That that's where the money ought to be invested. And what your research suggests is that that is only going to lead to a pileup on the detour. Potentially, yeah. Well, and I think, but I think it would, the focus would have to be on providing the type of world-class education, right? And not just sort of getting more people to graduate from high school or this kind of thing, because that's what we've seen. We've had more people graduate high school, more people go to college, but it hasn't been the same. It's been a qualitatively different education. So that's the, in the end, education may be the solution, a part a of part the solution, of, yeah. mm -hmm. but that it's got to be that investment Absolutely. in the quality mm -hmm. of the education. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you can talk to David also outside this context, <laughs> but I think we need to make a break, a short break, and with the speaker, the parent speaker, who comes in. Okay?